Uh, as always, I'm I'm sporting new footwear today. <laughs> That's right, Sarah. Sarah kicked me and broke my foot. <laughs> so before we get started, let me just remind you: next week we're doing our our all church Q and A, right? Question and answer. Uh, so if you have a question you'd like to submit, Dana's handing out cards and um, just write your question on the back and then put it in the offering when the offering goes by. Um, but if you come up with a question this week, you can email it too. That's fine. Um, all right. And I'm excited about next week. Uh, I'm a little, I'm a little scared. I'm not, you know, I'm not the Bible answer man, but uh, we're going to just have fun. Now, if you've put a question in trying to stump me, that'll be super fun. Because uh, <laughs> it'll give me the chance to go, I don't know. But I'm really looking forward to that. So if you've got a, a, a biblical question or a question about Christianity uh, that you that you want to talk about, write it on the back of the card and put it in the offering when it comes by. All right? Because that'll be, that'll be super fun next week. Um, now, let's pray, and we're going to worship God. So let's all stand together and pray. Jesus, we come before you this morning, and we want to bring our worship to you. God, would you just bring our focus off of all the stuff that's going on in our lives and bring it fully to you? Because God, we know that when our gaze and our attention is on you, our circumstances may not change, but our, our way of dealing with them certainly does. Knowing that we can trust you to work through us and in us and around us, that that you have our best uh, at heart. So God, we love you and we worship you today. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who Yeah. 
makes the darkness flee. Amen. Lord, hear your people roar. We are praising you today. And Lord, we are asking for you to intervene in our lives. You know the needs and the cries of our heart. And we give that to you. We know that prayer is what moves your heart. And I thank you for your love and your tender care. Amen. Amen. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. Oh. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, my. Ha 
the goodness of God. Amen. There we go. Oh, well, as we come to prayer time and, and offering and just to continue in worship, uh, I want us to think about in preparation for communion today. Um, we're going to talk about the second coming of Jesus today. It's something that we don't talk about a super lot, but it ties to communion. Because Jesus said, as often as you drink this cup and eat this bread, you bear witness to me until I come again. And it's easy for us to think about that he's not coming. He is coming. Now, here's what I want us to think about as we go to prayer. Today, we're just going to pray on our own quietly. Uh, what would, when you, if you really thought Jesus was coming back, next week. If you really knew that time's up next week, what would that do in your heart? Would you, would you be afraid? Oh, it's kind of like, you know, when your parents go away and they, you know, they're going to be back tomorrow. So you, you suddenly are like, oh, got to clean the house <laughs> or, or, and, or is it that, man, I just can't wait for them to get back. Um, if today your thought is, oh, if Jesus comes back, man, there's so much in my life that's a mess that I, I, I don't really want him to come back yet. <laughs> uh, let me just encourage you uh, to rethink your theology a little bit. And we're going to look at some stuff today. But to rethink that if you are a believer, if you've come into a relationship with Jesus, no matter what's going on, Jesus is going to treat us like the prodigal son. He's coming to meet us in the clouds. He's going to meet us halfway and we're going to go up. And But, but really... He's excited for us. He's excited to see us, not disappointed. Now, we're going to look at some passages that talk about, you know, make sure, make sure you're not evil. <laughs> but I think that that's a different situation than for believers. And we fall into that trap. And so today, as we come to prayer time, just say to Jesus, Jesus, what's that do inside of me when I think about that you could be back tomorrow, this week? Don't think 40 years, because that's just kind of our lifetime, right? I was confronted with this this, this week, and, and I had to think through. What would, what would be different if I really, really expected Jesus to return next Friday? One week to go. How would I, what does that do in me? Now, I've talked to people and they're like, oh, that makes me nervous. It makes me scared. It makes me think, oh, I got to be kinder to people or I want to look good when Jesus comes back. Let me just remind you this morning that if you're a believer, if you love Jesus, if he, if you're part of his family, then Jesus looks at you perfect through the blood of Jesus. God says, it's all been dealt with, past, present, and future. Now, there should be some outflow of that. But I want us to just stop and think and talk to God about it. God, what are you doing in my heart? Does that scare me? Does it excite me? Does it make me think, oh, there's so many things I haven't done yet. 
and let Jesus talk to you today. And then we'll continue in worship. Let's just pray together. Father God, today, there's so much that goes on in our lives. We get so caught up in work and relationships and all the things. Father, we worry about tomorrow and the next day. God, those are things that we need to pay attention to. But Father, today, would you... Would you just remind us how much you love us and how excited you are that we're part of your family. And God, today, we say with one heart, come, Lord Jesus, come. There's so many things that that make us have all sorts of different feelings. But God, today we want to focus on the good news of Jesus and what he's done for us at the cross so that we can Lord, so that we can just have that sense of expectancy as we as we move towards you. Father, as we give and worship through giving, as we continue to sing, as we take communion, God, we want to remember you and all you've done. Thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, this song, this special song, as many of you know, Sheldon, uh, Sheldon means this last week, uh, he went to be with Jesus. Five years of battling cancer and uh, God gave Sheldon the opportunity to be a light to a whole community that most of us will never get to see doctors and nurses and all sorts of stuff. And he was able to show Jesus to them. And today, Sheldon is celebrating at the throne of Jesus. And I'm excited about that. Now, I'm going to miss him. He's my burrito buddy. <laughs> But one of his favorite songs was I'll Fly Away. And he absolutely did this week. So we're going to sing this today uh, in remembrance of Sheldon. And, ex and be excited for him. Sad for us. But that's why Paul to the Thessalonian church says, Grieve not as those who have no hope but as those who know the truth, we will see Sheldon again. And his pain is over, and he is rejoicing in the greatest Sunday worship service uh, he's ever experienced. And that's pretty awesome. And maybe they're uh, going to sing I'll Fly Away today. I don't know. 
but we are. So that's why we're seeing this today, uh, to remember Sheldon. Stand up and let's... You can be seated. Oh. So, as we come to the communion table today, um, I was confronted this week by the idea of Jesus' return. And, I, and as I told you, it, it sparked some really good thought processes in me. And so I want us to look at a couple of passages real quick because this ties this ties to communion in such a good way ever since the enlightenment you guys know that term the enlightenment historically you know the renaissance happened and and there's a shift in thinking from uh all sorts of stuff, but into this idea, if we get the right knowledge in, the outcomes will fix themselves. That, that, we, that we lived in a world where science could fix everything. And, and we see it from the 1600s all the way through today, right? How many Trekkies are there in here? Are, Wow. Yes, Star Trek. Gene Roddenberry wrote Star Trek originally as this utopian idea that everyone was equal and there was no need for, uh, for, for labor because science had fixed so much stuff. And, um, but even in Star Wars, or Star Trek, thank you. You don't want to mix those, do you? <laughs> that this idea that, that science will bring us a revolution that will fix everything. Even last night, I was watching 
uh, a news show, and they were talking about that in the next 15 years, it's predicted that robots will take care of about 80% of the household chores we do. Um, you know, and of course, they showed the Jetsons and, you know, Rosie the... Ro was it Rosie? Yeah. Rosie? Rosie the robot, you know, she's running around and doing stuff. Uh, it, it shows you how dated it is. You know, she's lighting uh, Mr. Jetson's cigar. You know, that wouldn't fly today. But the, but the idea that, that technology is going to make life so much easier for us. Um, and it's been that way forever, right? In the early 1900s, with the invention of, well, the invention, the, the, be, the beginning the use of, of uh, electricity that suddenly we were going to have washing machines that we didn't have to scrub our clothes the way we used to and indoor lighting and that all this science was going to make our lives so much easier and better. Today, I don't know that our lives are that much easier or better. Now, I, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not a Luddite, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pro-technology, all right? Just, let me just say that. But if we're trusting in technology to make our life better, uh, that, that's not where it's going to go. Um, technology becomes a tool that we can use that's good. But today, so often, we get it backwards, right? We, we don't have technology as a tool we use. Technology uses us, it feels like. Jerry Seinfeld has, a, has a, a bit where he talks about that, you know, who is our real masters? It's our phones today. That we go everywhere with our phones and they tell us where to go, turn right here, turn left there. How many of you would get lost a lot if it wasn't for your phone? I hate to admit it, I would get lost a lot if it wasn't for my phone because uh, I don't worry about remembering how to get places because I can just say, hey, Siri, take me to this address. And it's like, all right. And usually I'm very disappointed in the route that it chooses. But... Self-driving cars, yes, all that kind of stuff. I say all that uh, to remind us that there's a mentality that goes that says, if we program our brains correctly, then our outcomes will be better. Um, one, phil one philosopher that I've read recently talks about that, that really the enlightenment brought us to a point where we were brains on a stick, which is different than a jalapeno on a stick, <laughs> right? You guys like Jeff Dunham? He's pretty funny. Jalapeno on a stick. But this idea that, that if we just get the right knowledge, it will, it will fix everything. And what it does, the enlightenment, what it, what, we gain many things in the enlightenment. But part of what we lost is this idea that we're whole people. That how we use our bodies. And, and I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the, the idea that we're holistic. That what we do with our, our, our physical being affects how we think and vice versa. That, that we come together uh, to be whole people. Communion is one of those things that it's the same every month. And it's a, it, it really is a ritual. But sometimes we fall into the trap of going through the motions of saying, yeah, we remember, right? Jesus said, do this as often as, often as you do this. You remember me and what I've done. It's, it's that the cup represents Jesus' blood on the cross. And the bread, the cracker, 
whether you choose the wheat or the rice option, gluten, gluten-free, either way, that it represents Jesus' body that was broken for us. In the first century, especially, when Jesus instituted this idea of communion to remember him by, the Jewish people would have very well understood that this was, this was a whole uh, symbol of what Jesus was doing. Because they knew very well that Deuteronomy says that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. Now, why did God choose that way of dealing with sin? I don't know. But I think at least part of it was because God wants us to realize that we're whole people. Do you realize that we're really made up of three parts? We're made up of three parts, just like God. We're one person, but we have a body, the physical part of us. We have a spirit the eternal part of us, and we have a soul, the willful part of us, how we deal and think. And, and, and you know what? Take one of those away, and we're less than who we really are. I could lose, uh, I can lose my knees, and I wonder about this. Jesus, when he came back uh, from the dead, said to Thomas, feel the scar in my hand and the wound in my side. It's still me. Will I have knee scars? In my new resurrected body, will I, will I still have titanium knees built by Stryker? Mm, I don't think so. But you know what? They're going to work way better than these. Will I have a shoulder that actually, you know, is not bionic? I'm really disappointed that I don't have a shoulder like Will Smith in iRobot, you know. But there's this idea that Jesus is bringing us to a holistic understanding of who we are. And all of that said, Jesus said, do this to remember me until I come again. In Matthew 24... 24 and 25, Jesus has this discussion, and we could go to Luke 19, uh, but it's all right before Jesus is crucified. He begins to talk about uh, his return, that he is going to come again physically in a body uh, as, as a whole person. And he says, Let's start in verse, let's start verse 23 of Matthew 24. Then if someone tells you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen people. See, I have warned you about this ahead of time. So if someone tells you, look, the Messiah is out here, out in the desert, don't bother to go and look. Or look, he's hiding here, don't believe it. For as the lightning flashes in the east and shines out in the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. Just as the gathering of the vultures shows there is a carcass nearby, so the signs indicate that the end is near. Immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth, and they will see the Son of Man coming on, a, on the clouds of heaven with power and great joy. And he will send out his angels with mighty blast of trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth in heaven. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. 
In the same way, when you see all these things, you can know his return is very near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene, uh, from the scene until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. However, no one knows the day or the hour uh, when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time of Noah, right up to the time Noah entered the bo his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field and one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at a mill. One will be taken and the other left. So you too must keep watch. For you don't know what day the Lord, your Lord is coming. Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not, present his, not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. A faithful, sensible servant is one whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the servant is evil and thinks, my master won't be back for a while? And he begins beating the other servants, partying and getting drunk. The master will return unannounced and unexpected, and he will cut the servant to pieces and assign him to a place with the hypocrites in a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. A couple, and then in chapter 25, Jesus gives several uh, parables. You know, he gives the parable of the 10 bridesmaids uh, who come and they, they're, they're waiting for the bridegroom. Now, what you need to know is that Jesus uses Jewish wedding uh, understanding very often in uh, his, his end times talks. In the first century, uh, a wedding would be, you know, arranged by two families. The groom would come to the, 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 bride mate, the bride's father and say, I really love her. I want to I wanna marry her. And they would sit down and work that out. There's dowries and all that stuff. But if that match was made, there was a, a covenant made that they were betrothed or married. But then the groom had to go away. And he built a studio apartment, basically, on his father's house. Because Jewish tradition was that... Uh, for the first year of marriage, men didn't work, they didn't go to war, they stayed home and they loved and got to know their wife. Now, that's something I think maybe we should bring back. It's too late for me, but you know. And so it was the father's responsibility to support the couple, the groom's father supported the couple but what he got out of it was a man cave after the first year, okay? And so the, the, the room that they lived in was built onto the father's house. So you remember Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there are many mansions. And I'll come and get you when it's done. Well, here's the fun part. So that mansion, that room that was being built, the, the, was not finished 
until the father said it was done. So, you know, as any young guy would do, he throws up a, a, a quick shelter because he's like, man, I'm going to go get my bride and we're going to have some fun and we're going to live right here. And... But he's got to wait until, until the dad comes in and goes, all right, it's done. But you know, the first time he comes in, he's like, this is not going to work. Tear it all down and start over. All of us as men would totally do this to our boys. Ah, I've changed my mind. I don't like the carpet. Let's change that up. Let's go with the crown molding, not just the regular molding. Let's, 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 let's put a nice picture window over here because someday this is going to be my room and, you know, you're going to be gone. And so I'm going to, I want it just the way I want it. The other part is that naturally, as guys, we mess with each other. Totally do. And so, so dads would, would wait until like the middle of the night and then come in and go, oh, by the way, it's done. Go get your, go get your bride. And, and he'd be like, oh, yes, I'm going to go. And they would jump out of bed and all the, all the groomsmen, they go through town banging stuff and being loud. And, and, and the bride, the bride is waiting through all of this, right? She's, you know, probably the first week she's like, okay, he's probably not going to be done with the house right away, but I got the dress laid out. I've got everything ready so that when he comes, I'm ready. And she's got her bridesmaids with her and they're doing stuff just to be ready. But nobody knows when that's going to happen until the father says, you're done. Go get your bride. So Jesus uses this analogy for us that, that we, that we want to be expectant of our groom coming to get us. Now earlier, when we talked about Jesus coming again, it's easy for us to have that kind of knot in our stomach like, oh, I don't know that I'm measuring up today to what, what I should be, right? I don't know that I'm, that, that, man, there's stuff in my life that I need to fix before Jesus comes back. And I think that that comes from a misunderstanding of who we are in Christ. We think that Jesus is going to return as, as a as a drill sergeant coming to do an inspection. Now, some of you guys have been in the military and ladies have been in the military. And, you know, especially in boot camp, inspections were not something you probably look forward to. Anybody really look forward to an inspection, you know? You got everything, and the drill sergeant comes in and he kicks your bed over. How come your bed's not made right? Right? We we and and there's a process of why they do that, and uh, it's to break down and then build back up and all that stuff. But we kind of live with that expectation that Jesus is going to return and be like, "Oh, I knew it. Look at you. Here you are. I'm back. And what are you doing? Fill in the blank." Instead, and there is a sense of that, right? That, that we want to make sure we're the bride when Jesus returns. When Jesus, when Jesus tells these parables, he, he's saying, be ready. Not because Jesus is coming to judge us, but because he's coming as the bridegroom that's coming to take away his bride. And how much he loves us and cherishes us and is excited for us. But we don't think that way very often. We think, okay, it's inspection day. It's not inspection day. When Jesus returns, it's going to be wedding day. Now, wedding days can be stressful. 
you know, we've all been there at that, you know, we've watched Bridezilla as a TV show. You're like, ooh, she's crazy. One of my best friends got married and it was very stressful and I was like, dude, are you sure? It's not too late. I've got my car. We can, you know. He and his wife are super happily married and they're great. I've seen it on the other side too, you know, where, where the, the groom turns into a mess and you're like, I don't know if, you know, maybe we put this off or rethink. No, there's this excitement that says, it's our wedding day. And you're really nervous and, and you have to pee a lot because you're so nervous, <laughs> you know. I don't know why, but I had to pee like six times the hour before I got married to Sarah. I'm like, oh, okay, I gotta, I'll be back, you know. And I was just so nervous because I was excited that my bride was going to walk down the aisle. I wasn't worried that she was going to think, oh, I'm so disappointed that I'm doing this. That wasn't my thought. Those came later, right? <laughs> In that moment, I was like, yes, this is going to be so good. And at our wedding, Sarah and I are standing there and... Um, the sound guy accidentally played our recessional music in the middle of, in the middle of the sermon to us. And unbeknownst to, we didn't realize that we both did it. We both did like this little ball kick thing, you know. And, and my dad was like, ah, oh, you guys belong together. It wasn't until afterwards I was like, what was that about? Oh, we, oh, you know, we were in sync that day. But there was this sense of, man, I'm excited that Jesus is coming. I'm excited that Sarah's going to walk down the aisle. I hope I don't have to pee again, you know, because I'm so nervous. But it, but it was one of those things where we need to change the way we think about Jesus' return. We need to think, man... Jesus is coming to get us because he loves us so much. He wants us. He, he cherishes us. He has been working to put together this incredible room for us to live in together in his father's house. So we want to be ready. Not because we think an inspection's coming, but because we want to be ready to go. We want to run out the door. And it doesn't matter what the house looks like when you leave the house. You know, now I don't know about you guys, but we clean our house before we go on vacation because it's nice to come home to a clean house. If I was leaving behind a house to go to a new mansion, man, I don't care what this house looks like. I'm going to the new one. Now, that changes the way we function, right? It changes the way we think about things. How do, I, how do I prepare for Jesus coming? What would, I, what would I do differently if I knew next Friday at 3 o'clock uh, Jesus was going to return? Would I, would I be more kind? See, we often go, oh, well, I'd change my behavior. I'm not looking for us to change our behavior today. I'm looking for us to change our heart. Our wholeness, right? The enlightenment says just change the way you act and, and it'll fix things. Well, Paul actually says that physical exercise and discipline accomplishes much. But it doesn't really accomplish anything to change our heart. What changes our heart is spiritual discipline. Now, discipline's a hard word in our culture, I know, but really it's, it's intentionality. That I'm thinking about Jesus. I'm, I'm moving toward Jesus. And if we're doing that naturally, it changes the way we, f 
we live. Some things will become less important. Some things will become more important. And we will say, Jesus, come. It's easy for me to think, you know, I hope Jesus holds off until I can see my boys get married. I hope Jesus holds off until this or that. But I'm coming to the point where I realize I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry because there's going to be a wedding feast. There's going to be a wedding feast. And I'm really glad that uh, I think it's in Isaiah. It talks about the wedding feast and it says the choicest meats will be there. The, the best vegetables and fruits will be there. The best bread you've ever eaten will be there. Shannon made some sourdough this week and we ate it in our house. Woo, it was good. When she's got a couple thousand years to work on her sourdough recipe, it's going to be really good. You think, you think you're a good cook now? Wait until you've had 10 or 11, 20, 50,000 years to perfect what you do. Then it'll be amazing. Jesus said, when you, on a regular basis, do this, you do it to remember me. Not, not as, not as a inspector who's coming to inspect what's going on, but as a groom who loves you. There's a reason that Jesus uses that analogy in Scripture so often, that he is the groom and we are the bridegroom. That's why Paul in Ephesians 5 says that marriage is a, a picture of the way God loves his church. Imperfectly, but Jesus does it perfectly. So today, when you come, take both. Take a cup and a cracker. And we're going to and we're going to take communion together to remember. Now I hope that this has helped to maybe change the way we think about Jesus' return. And then wait, and we'll take together, okay? But let's start by coming and getting, getting a cup and a cracker. You only have to make one trip today. Come down the middle, go out the sides. It's just like, it's just like the ocean waves, you know, all that good stuff. And... And we're going to continue to worship through the understanding that Jesus is coming again. He's coming again. Let me pray for us. Jesus, today, we come before you and we want to remember that you're coming again. It's so easy to get caught up in all the things we have to do all the struggles that we have to deal with. Lord, I just pray today. I pray today that we would remember that you are a groom so excited to come get your bride. And that's us. How cool is that? Jesus, we love you. We want you to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When you're ready, you come.
Jesus came as a whole person. He, he wasn't just a physical aberration. He was, he, was, he was a whole person. And Jesus wants us to experience him with our brain and our body together. 
And we do this, and it has amazing impact. Not because suddenly the bread, the cracker, turns into the body of Jesus as we eat it. We're not saved because of what it does, but it reminds us. And it transforms and renews the thinking of our mind. That we would say, Jesus, man, he went through so much to get us. He went through so much to buy us back. There's a reason that there's a whole Old Testament book where God says, Hosea, I want you to go marry a prostitute. Because it's a picture of how much I love my people. She kept running away. He's like, go buy her back. (laughs) Go get her. God loves you and I so much that no matter what, he's going to come after us. You walk away, he's going to chase you down. If you're his bride, no matter how messed up we are, no matter how unfaithful we are, he is faithful to us. Now, Jesus told that story through Hosea, and it's not gender specific. (laughs) We as men run away and God chases us down and brings us back because his love is so complete for us not only does he chase us down and brings us back he pays for us so that we could be brought back into brought back into his family the whole Bible is the story of God getting his family back It's the greatest story ever. All other stories are just shadows of the story of history, of God getting back his family. So Jesus says, as often as you take this bread, it is my body that is broken for you. Do this, eat this in remembrance of me. Eat with me. Then Jesus took the cup. He said, this is my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sin. We talk about it every month. But you know why? It's because I need to be reminded. I need to be reminded what Jesus did for me. That while I was still his enemy, Christ died for me. And I think, oh, Jesus, come back. Anybody had a week where you were like, Jesus, just come back right now. I'm okay with that. Peter dealt with people who were saying, "Ah, God's kind of forgotten about you. He's so slow. You keep saying he's going to return, but he hasn't. 2,000 plus years, Jesus has not returned yet. Peter says it's not because God is slow, but that because God loves us and he desires that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance. So Jesus isn't slow, he's patient. He doesn't want anybody to be left out. Now, here's what you need to know. Every single prophecy, every single event that needed to take place before Jesus could return because God's not going to break his own prophecy has happened. Jesus could come back tomorrow. He could come back right now. And that's a little weird for us to think about. But I hope today you began to think about it a little differently. 
Jesus is returning, not as an inspector, but as a groom. Here's the other part. Even if Jesus was returning as an inspector, he came in and cleaned everything before he came back. So it wasn't, it wasn't the left up to us because he shed his blood for us. He shed his blood so that we could um, be returned into his family. Jesus took the cup and he blessed it and he said, this is the blood of my new covenant. As often as you drink this, you do show witness until I come again. Let's drink together. Mm. I love grape juice. This week, we're going to sing a song to go out But this week, as you think about that Jesus could return, when you're dealing with the the auto shop that's fixing your car because it's broken down again, say, we need to get it fixed, but man, Jesus could be coming. So I'm not going to worry as much about that. When you're dealing with a job that's super hard, don't worry. It's short time, right? The Navy SEALs like to say the only easy day was yesterday. Lots of military people do. Don't worry about that. Just know that you can make it until Jesus comes again. You're not just treading water. He is empowering you to live in a way that is so positive that you're free, free to say, come Lord Jesus, whenever you want. I'm ready. Not because we're sick of being here and we think, oh, that'll be better. It will be better. (laughs) But because we are expectant brides waiting for our groom who loves us so much. I'm so glad that God used that analogy. That he loves us. He pursues us. He chases us. Because he wants us. He doesn't need us. Remember, God didn't create humans or the whole universe because he was like, man, I'm so lonely. I need somebody to hang out with. He was complete as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they had so much love for each other. They said, we, let's create people so that we can pour our love out on them, knowing full well that we would mess up. Now, we all did it as part of Adam. By one man, sin entered into the world. But by another man, forgiveness for all of us, came into the world. And we just have to accept it because it's a free gift. As we, as we sing this last song, it's a great Phil Wickham song about, you know, the return of Christ, that we'll be raptured. Our feet are going to come off the ground and uh, we're going to meet him in the air. Think about it differently today. Jesus isn't coming as as an inspector. He's coming as a groom, passionately for his bride. Let's stand and sing as we go out.
Awesome. Well, one quick thing. Guys, 6 o'clock this Friday, fire and meat night. We're going to do grilled pork. Mmm, it's going to be good with other stuff. All right, shall we wave goodbye? Oh, check out my mic. Bye, everybody. Have a great week. All right.